Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Apostle T.B. Walker. It is 5 o'clock and it's Wednesday, so I know you know exactly what time it is. It is time for Live at 5. Certainly glad to have you here with me today. Uh, we've got some great questions for you. We've got a good midweek infusion that I think is going to be a blessing to you. Again, the midweek infusion is about giving you something to really think about from the scripture, something that you know we can ponder on and begin to really apply to our lives. It's really quick. But I think it's also powerful, just like the word. Let's take a look at it. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Well, chapter number 3. Uh, just And verse number 1. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now, these are people that he calls brethren, right? So we know that they're Christians. Listen, that's actually what the problem is. These are people who are like uh, free-born citizens in a country who cannot speak the language of that particular nation. Paul says, I can't talk to you in the language of the kingdom because, you know, you are not spiritual. Now, the thing is, they have the Holy Spirit, yet they're behaving like people who are really carnal, who are led by their flesh. The problem is that they're lacking an understanding of not only who Christ is, but they lack understanding like babies, like infants. So Paul says, I can't really talk to you as spiritual people. Now, what kind of people are they? Well, these are weak, reactive people who are led by their emotions, who are led by their feelings, and not by the truth of God. You know, this is a self-imposed developmental re uh, to retardation, if you will, as Christians. There are people who are putting themselves in this very same place uh, as babes who, where there's a need now to grow and there's language that's being spoken that's meant to help go to uh, people go to the next level, but they can't quite understand it because they are still living as fleshly people. They can, you know, these are people that Paul is talking about that are living uh, based upon their bodily appetites, based upon their whims, their own feelings, their, you know, instead of really relying and living in the power of God. Listen, the truth is, these are people where flesh doesn't dominate, obviously, every area of their life, or they wouldn't have given any kind of uh, kind of evidence or proof that they're believers. There's some things that are, there's some fruit, there, there's some areas that are sprouting, but the truth of the matter is, it, they are believers. They are people who are who, who know who think who God is. They know the things of God. Yet, in some significant ways, they're characterized more by their flesh than they are by their spirit. Listen, when you look at this, this is a person who knows to do differently, who has the knowledge of what it takes to do something differently, and they simply do not do it. Listen, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, who are we? These are not people who are not saved. These are people that Paul calls brethren, but he recognized they're living so far below the privileges and the promises that God has given. Listen, let's grow up. Let's not live as babes. Let's let's be able to hear the language of the, the, the growing, mature believer that, that literally speaks to us growing and moving forward as opposed to staying stuck and stagnant in a place where people are carrying us. It's time to stand up and walk and to put away childish things. So I want you to really begin to contemplate this because this is in all areas of our lives. This is in areas where we're like babies in forgiveness. You know, we're like babies in trust. We're like babies in faith in, in Christ. You know, where we, we just are still in that same place of infancy where Paul says, listen, the next level has a language that I want you to be able to hear. And you can't hear it as a baby because babies don't talk and babies can't understand. So I want you to really look at this because God's calling us higher. Listen, we've got four great questions today and I want us to really get to those. So let's take a look at question number one. Um, here's what it says. Why does it seem that God makes it intentionally hard to enter heaven? The scripture seems to, to make the way to heaven narrow and hard to find. Why would he do that? Let's take a look at that scripture. Um, you didn't give me that, but I think this is the one you're looking at. Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse number 13, ending in number 14. Here's what it says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter into it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, that's heaven, and only few find it. Now, let's understand what this narrowness is, because this is not, you know, God's attempt to make sure that, you know, he makes it hard for us to get to heaven. Narrow is in the sense of what it takes actually to get entrance into heaven. That narrow gate is Jesus Christ. It simply is, listen, this is the only way. 
Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Listen, I'm the only road. So there isn't a broad, there, this broad road, you know, expands into many, many different trunks where Jesus is talking about a narrow road. Listen, Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 3, 27 through 28. I want you to get this. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal, which is another way of saying our entrance into heaven, is not based on our good deeds. It is based on our faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. So as long as our arrival to heaven is based upon works that we do, any merits that we, uh, you know, things that we should accomplish, our personal efforts, yeah, it's going to seem hard. This is the broad path that most people take, that they take that same road that that looks like that you're talking about, that, that, that self road. But listen, let me tell you what that path is. It's the impossible path. The other path is the impossible path. It's, it has no outlet. It's that one sign that says no outlet. No matter how close you see the highway, you can't get there from that particular road. You know, the Bible says we're saved by faith through, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, which is a gift of God, right? So when you look at that, it, we're saved by God's gracious gift. Faith means that we trust in God and what he's done. We trust in what God has done through his son, Jesus, and nothing that we have done. So when you look at this and, and look and ask yourself, is this hard? Listen, I want you to begin to look at this. It's hard if you have to make get yourself there. It's hard if you got to do all the heavy lifting. But you know what? When Jesus was asked by his followers, that, that very same question that you're asking, you know, what do we need to do to enter into heaven? Like, what, what do we need to do to be saved? Here's what Jesus said. This is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. So when you look at this, this is far from hard. When, matter of fact, when you look at this, this is easy. God has actually done everything possible to make sure that this is easy for us, even to the point of becoming like us, becoming a man, walking the earth with us, even allowing us to crucify him for this very same purpose, for redeem, for the redemption of our sins. So Jesus never sugarcoated, uh, you know, what it was going to be like to follow him. You know, the truth is, uh, most people aren't willing to really pay the price that you need to take, uh, to, to pay, to go through that narrow road. Listen, that one road only has one toll. Jesus says this, and he said to all of them, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Listen, it's natural. Human nature gravitates toward comfort. And guess what's on that broad road? Comfort. It's made broad. It's made comfortable. It's made wide so that people won't have to face their own reality. They won't have to face the reality of the having to deny themselves in order to follow Christ. So when you look at the idea that all that Jesus is saying is, listen, trust in me. And what I've done, don't trust in yourself. Listen, this seems pretty easy to me. That's far from hard. Listen, I hope that helps you with that. And I hope descriptionally you'll be able to look at this and be able to see. That's a trick of the enemy to make this way, you know, hard. Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. I'm not making this easy. Jesus already has. Listen, hopefully that helps. Let's take a look at question number two. It says, there seems to be a huge double standard with the issue of prayer in schools. Why is it that only Christians should have prayer in school, but not Muslim stu students in public schools? All right, listen, if we're living in a perfect world, in a perfect situation where everybody will acknowledge the biblical sovereignty of Jesus Christ, you know, as their Lord and Savior, um, that, listen, this would be great. We would never have this conversation. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. And for that reason, I actually don't believe that there should be a uh, prayer in school. Here, listen, and I know that's going to be controversial to some, but our public schools are publicly funded. And the truth of the matter is they were never intended to be places of religious training. That's a farmed out job that they're not supposed to have. You know, listen, we've already farmed out feeding our kids and, and, you know, picking them up and taking them where they need to go. We farmed out almost everything to somebody. But the truth of the matter is the job of raising our children and teaching them prayer is not the role of the public school. It's actually the role of the home. It's the role of the family. It's the role of the church. Worship is not uh, the place for the pub. You know, it's not the place or the purpose of the public school. And guess what? 
The public school is not qualified to actually lead worship. Students are actually, they, you know, let's get back to what they go to school for. Reading, writing, arithmetic, that's what they're there for. They're, they're there to learn about literature and mathematics and science and all of those wonderful things that are going to be a part of their life. There's no law that's written that says that they can't pray on their own. There's no law that says that they can't read their Bible, they can't pull out their Bible in school. And listen, what, you don't, what we have to remember is this. It's easy for us to clamor for prayer in school. But I think you make a great point with your question. We don't realize that when we open up that door for prayer in school, that's also going to be prayer for non-Christians as well. You, listen, you know, we are advocating most of this for Christian prayer. That's what we're thinking. But the truth of the matter is, if that door is open and there's prayer in school, then there's got to be prayer, uh, you know, Muslim prayer. There's got to be prayer, Buddhist prayer. There's got to be prayer. Even atheists may have a non-prayer prayer. So, you know, when you begin to look at all of what's there, uh, the Jewish prayer, the Hindu prayer, all of those things would have to be allowed. And why? Because they're citizens. They're taxpayers. The, the, the schools that are built are built with the money that they actually put there. So, yeah, that would be a Pandora's box. And here's the, the final thing that I want to say about prayer in school. We've gotten so bent out of shape. And, and listen, this is clearly my opinion. There's nothing, I don't think that there's, any, there's nothing biblical that you're going to be able to find where God has mandated that a public school, because they weren't around at the time, he has never mandated, like this teacher in third grade is supposed to teach your child how to pray. No, Deuteronomy 6 does say, listen, that's your job as a parent to teach your children as they lie down, as they walk along the way, that we are to teach them these very same precepts that we've learned. That's the job of the family. That's the role of the parent. So when you look at this, one of the things you've got to look at and you've got to understand, we make a, a huge error when we begin to look at any governmental organization, such as public school, in any public organization to reinforce our Christian values and beliefs. That's not what the school is about. It's not meant to do that. And that's fa a faulty thinking because as society changes, so goes the school. So when you begin to look at this, the Bible tells us clearly something that's obvious here. The world is opposed to the things of God, right? The world is opposed to the things of God. So nobody can stop a child from praying. Nobody can stop a child from, you know, reading their Bible. They're only simply saying you can't organize this on a public forum. Prayer can be banned from school. It's, go it's banned now. It's going to be banned in so many other areas. But what you've got to really understand is this. The Holy Spirit is not limited. Get that, because that's so important. The arm of the Lord, the Bible says, is not too short to save. That's really important to really get. So God is not slack here in any way. And he's able to really, really bless. But we don't need the government to help us to do the job that God has called us to do. We need to get back to the job that we as a, as a, a church and we as family members are supposed to do. Listen, Let's get to question number three. We've got uh, one, uh, this third question. It says, I live in the Bible Belt of the United States, and most of the people I know are church-going people who live with sickness, poverty, and no voice. How can this be right? All right, I get it. You know, I mean, because there's this thought that I guess believers aren't supposed to get sick. Believers don't, you know, they're supposed to be wealthy. Uh, I guess people are supposed to hear what we say. But scripture doesn't pretend in any way that sickness is not going to be even among the believer. And it doesn't act like sickness doesn't exist. We are the ones who try to act like it doesn't exist. It's something that each of us are going to grapple with. Some of, Each of us are going to deal with in our lifetime. The truth is, here's the truth. Sickness is here to stay as long as bodies are here. As long as flesh is here, sickness is going to be here. Sickness came as a result uh, you know, and, and, and I want you to get this, came as a result of sin. This is like not a non-Christian condition. You know, they get sick, but we don't get sick. Absolutely not. This is a human condition. And the Bible absolutely openly talks about this reality. You know, from the very beginning, we understand how sickness and death and illness and all of these things came into being. They come as a result of the original sin of Adam and Eve, that, that original sin of them eating of the fruit in the garden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free. That's what he said. You are free 
to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Listen, I want you to get that. When you begin to see what's really there, when you really understand what's there, what you find is Adam and Eve were told about this death process that would begin the moment that they ate. And guess what? Sickness is a part of that death process. That's exactly what sickness does. Now, so, so believers are going to get sick. That's a human condition. As it pertains to wealth, I want you to get this, and you really need to understand this. Wealth is no sure sign of God's blessing upon anybody's life. There are plenty of evil people that have been wealthy. And poverty is not a sure sign of God's displeasure. There are plenty of people that have been poor, including Jesus himself, that have been poor and in, 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 in coming from areas of poverty that have been truly immensely blessed by God. Matter of fact, it's, impo it's possible to actually be poor in material things and wealthy in spiritual things. Let me read this to you. This is from Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. It says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Get that. He says, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He says, listen, I know your poverty. Check that out. But he says, you are rich. These are his people. So when you begin to look at wealth, the Bible says, listen, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. So wealth is not necessarily a sign of greatness. Wealth, when you hear how wealth is actually talked about, wealth is overwhelmingly talked about from a position of warning. Wealth is overwhelmingly talked about from a, a place of wariness of temptation. You know, being wealthy is not a sin. It's not a sin to be rich in any way, nor is it a sign of God's approval in any way as well. The sin is not found in being wealthy, but it is in how we view wealth and the ways we use it. How we use it is one of those things that really impact it. Listen, Jesus was poor. The Bible says he, they, that the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. So when we look at this, he didn't have a voice. His voice was not heeded by the masses. So the very people that you're looking at right here may actually be following in some footsteps that are very familiar when you begin to look at the Bible. Listen, one of the things that you'll find out about Christianity and when you read this, this, this scripture, uh, and I don't want anybody to fool you, we were never promised a bed of roses. We were never promised in any way. Uh, that we would be rich. We were never promised that we would have a voice, that people would heed us. Matter of fact, it's actually to the contrary. We've been actually promised that people would persecute us, that they would hate us. Jesus said, if they if they hated me, they'll hate you. He said, they're going to throw you before the synagogues. They're going to try to take your things. And historically, we've seen that the world has impoverished in some ways, some places, Christians, simply on the basis of their Christianity. That in no way can be a place where we look now and say, well, you don't have money because they stole it from you, you must not be blessed of God. Or, you know, politically, you have no voice, you must not be blessed of God. No, listen, Jesus does not offer us wealth, nor does he offer us um, a voice, nor will he offer us, you know, any of those, those uh, you know, a complete life of um, health. That's nothing that's, pro that's promised to us. Listen, what's promised to us? A cross. And he expects us to bear it. And he said to all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Listen, I want to encourage you. There may be more to these poor, voiceless, uh, uh, sick people than you think. They may be in a vein of God that you may not be, uh, may be looking at. Listen, I want to encourage you as you begin to judge spiritual things, judge spiritual things by spiritual things. You cannot judge spiritual things by carnal things. And wealth is a carnal thing. Health is something that literally we enjoy when we have it, but sickness and disease and that death process comes upon all people. It comes upon all people. So listen, I hope that that helps to rearrange and alter some of the ways that you may be thinking about what a believer is supposed to be. Because I suspect that that's the root of it. The root of it is what you're really thinking. This is what, a, if a person is believing God, they'll never get sick. If a person is believing God and they're blessed by God, they're going to get the job. They're, they're going to make sure they're going to have the house. That's just a lie. That's not biblical. It has no standing theologically. And it has no standing historically. The, uh, the history shows us that that's not true. But we have a history of showing that the Bible talks about the poor in spirit shall see God. So 
you know, when you begin to understand what the scripture is really all about, you'll understand that those things are not a measure of whether a believer is in God's favor or not. Hopefully that helps. Let's take a look at our final question here. This is, uh, and, and I, I really like all these questions. I, again, I'm so uh, uh, glad for the people who, you know, sent these questions in. And I want to make sure that I definitely let you know that those, we've got, a, I've got kind of a list, a backlog of some questions that have been sent, but I'm going to get to your questions. I'm going to make sure I get those out and I'll definitely email you to let you know, listen, I'm going to be answering your question today. So listen, this is our fourth and final question for this Live at Five. And I want to get to this. It says, um, if Satan knows the Bible so well, why doesn't he simply defy written prophecy by doing the opposite of what it says he's going to do to make God out to be a liar? I get it. You know what? I mean, if you had the blueprint and you wanted to disprove God, if that was the whole thing, I get that. But you know what? We serve the God of truth. And the Bible says that Satan is a liar. And simply because Satan is a liar, he cannot defy truth. He won't defy truth, but he actually can't defy truth because lying and evil is his nature. So no matter how hard he would try, if he would try, truth of the matter is he is so damned. He is so set on his way that he is not going to try. But if he were going to try to defy the truth of God, in the end, he would find himself doing, no matter how he tried, he would find himself doing what he does, which is sin, which is lie, which is murder. That's his nature. He comes to kill, steal, and to destroy. That's exactly what he does. So no matter what he was, I'm not going to kill, steal, and destroy today. It's his nature. You know, it's kind of like asking a lion not to be a lion. You know, listen, I'm going to put you in here with the sheep today. Don't bite one. No way. A lion is going to be a lion. That's exactly how a lion is going to do. A thief is going to be a thief. Listen, I promise I'm not going to take it. Turn your back and see what a thief does. A thief is going to be a thief. They've got to steal. The second reason why, you know, listen, the Satan can't, you know, and I'm sure he's looked at the book and, you know, looked and said it's been predicted of what he's going to do. And I, what I need to do is just defy that. Well, listen, here's the other thing. He, he's already been trying to mess up God's plan. Satan, he's always tried to do it, but here's the thing. He can't comprehend God. He can't comprehend the things of God. He doesn't know the things of God. He doesn't understand God's plan. The Lord says, I alone know the thoughts I think toward you, right? To people, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. We don't know his full plan. Satan can't comprehend what he's doing. So therefore, he can't thwart something he can't comprehend. And since he will certainly try to, to destroy the plan of God as he did with Adam, as he did with Jesus on the cross. He had no idea that by bringing forth, even, you know, inducing sin to come into the world, he had no idea that that was the entrance of Jesus. Jesus was, okay, now that sin has come, what do we need? We need a savior. He had no idea that by inducing a man to destroy Christ, that what simply was falling right into God's plan. So the reality is, because we serve a God who makes all things work together to make sure his plan works, that he watches over his word, so that, and, and he's going to make sure that, that not only is that word performed, but it's going to accomplish everything he sent it to do, there's absolutely no way that the devil is going to be able to thwart the plan of God, even if he wanted to, his nature would not allow him. Listen, here's the thing about Satan, and that we got to really understand his, his, you know, his uh, fate is already sealed. There, there, there's no turning back. Truth be told, God is, you know, there, there's no negotiating here. But Satan doesn't want it either. The truth is, he is bent on the on his destruction. He doesn't know he's going to be destroyed, but Satan is going all out. So the truth will be told. That's one of the reasons why we don't see any repentance here with Satan. We don't see, you know, any of working where Satan can possibly turn his fate is sealed. And so he is doing exactly this. He's trying his best to destroy prophecy, to make sure that it doesn't come to pass. And because he is a liar and because prophecy is true, Satan cannot A, comprehend it, and B, because he can't comprehend it, he can't mess with it. He will simply be a tool used to make sure that it actually comes to pass. That's exactly what happens. The revelation that Job needs, God used Satan to get Job to the point where he would ask the right question. He's a tool. 
So I want you to really understand as you look at this, Satan doesn't have power. And what that's meant for us to understand is not only is it that Jesus has power, but it's meant for us to understand the power that he's given us. Listen, we're at the end of our Live at Five. I hope that you were blessed by these questions and I hope that you were blessed by the answers. Listen, it's important that we share. And one of the reasons for sharing is just this. There's somebody that probably, well, I'm not going to say probably, I believe there's somebody who needs to hear uh, one of those answers. Uh, somebody who's thinking some of the very same things that the writers are thinking. That person who's living in the Bible Belt. I imagine there's other people who are living in the Bible Belt who are hearing prosperity gospel, who are saying, how can these people call themselves Christians and they're living in that shack? How can they be Christians and call themselves, you know, Bible thumping believers and yet, you know, they're, they're sick and they're, they're, they're claiming it, they're receiving it, they believe it, that they're sick. No. The reality is that somebody needs to hear this answer concerning what a believer is. Somebody's going to need to hear this. So your job of sharing is extremely important. Listen, we're going to be back here again tomorrow at 730. Once again, for Bible study, breaking open the bread of life, making sure that God's people are fed in our sphere of influence. Listen, it may not be huge, may not go wide, but it's going to go exactly where God sends it to. And so we have this great opportunity to expand it ourselves by simply sharing, by telling our friends about it, and by discussing some of these very same things. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me because I'd love to be able to answer your questions right here, Live at 5. Listen, God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 730 right here for Bible study. God bless you. Have a great Wednesday.